for joining us. We're excited to bring you a discussion on cultural competence in special operations forces with Dr. Luis Rasmussen. The complexity of today and tomorrow's strategic environments requires that SOF operators maintain not only the highest levels of warfighting expertise, but also cultural knowledge and diplomacy. The objective is called 3D operators. It describes a multi-dimensional force prepared to lay the groundwork in a myriad of diplomatic development and defense activities that contribute to our government's pursuit of vital national interests. These diplomatic skills are operationalized through the exercise of competencies in cross-cultural interaction and communication. This discussion will explore the ways in which SOF addresses these competencies by looking at how the various service components select and assess candidates. Given the recent and still contested interest in cultural competence among special forces, our conversation will address the ways in which SOF can empower this competency. Cultural competency ties in closely to our focus here at Mission Essential. And of course, cultural stand understanding is a key component of global security. The type and diversity of threats demand ongoing cultural understanding and intelligence. And as always, my shameless plug to give you context, Mission Essential is the largest provider of language services to DOD. We have completed over 100,000 missions with 20,000 linguists in 83 countries. And specific to SOCOM, we currently have over 400 personnel in theater. Our services include language, cultural, and intelligence solutions. We hope this conversation, as always, will inform and inspire you. I'm privileged today to introduce Dr. Luis Rasmussen, a cognitive psychologist and co-founder and principal scientist at Global Cognition. Her work aims to understand and improve the professional cultural competence. In September 2020, she co-authored Save Your Ammo, Working Across Cultures for National Security. Rasmussen is a lead developer of the Adaptive Readiness for Culture Model, ARC, a competency model that defines the skills people need to adapt quickly to new cultures and work effectively with diverse partners. Welcome, Dr. Rasmussen, and thank you for being with us today. And let me just start by saying that releasing a book during a global, pandem uh, global pandemic must have been interesting. So um, although, you know, with nowhere to go, reading is certainly something we can all do to keep our sanity. So how has the book release been and, uh, and how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Brian, for the great introduction. And yes, that was certainly uh, daunting to put a book out and just when the pandemic was starting, uh, really. And we were hoping that meant people would have more time to read. Um, so I, I think certainly that has been the case, but it's been a little bit unfortunate not have, to have been able to, to go out and meet people and, and speak about the book, which I had hoped to do. So these kinds of events, like what you're doing here, is a really great opportunity to to reach um, hopefully um, future readers, uh, or current readers of, of our book. Oh, that's great, that's great. Dan, we're certainly all trying to be creative and in, in how we can engage in this uh, in this time. So, all right, well, let me um, let me get to some questions here. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, certainly our focus is to, to have a nice casual discussion about, about uh, some of the things that impact the soft uh, soft world and certainly from your, from your subject matter expertise, uh, the critical element of culture um, obviously plays a role. The training alignment between language and culture uh, instruction and, um, versus the in-theater application, mm -hmm. right? So in, in your book, you outline some of the skills and strategies and showcase some examples of scenarios that, you know, highly experienced national security professionals can draw on to adapt quickly and work effectively in new cultures. So I'd like to discuss some of the elements today and explore potential ways to introduce these skills into training and, and operations. So... Uh, so let's dig in. Uh, in my own experience as a marine linguist, as you know, um, I found myself in many situations that challenged my cultural competency muscles, if you will, um, a few that definitely put my, my ego in check. Um, so if, if you could, uh, what is cultural competence? And um, tell us how the adaptive readiness uh, for culture model differs from other cultural competence frameworks. All right, yeah, well, first of all, um, there are a number of uh, definitions of what cultural competence uh, is out there. And so, but at a high level, you can say in general that cultural competence is really the ability to work effectively with people from a different cultural background. So that's at a very high level. The research that uh, we have been engaging in over the last 15 years really has been trying to dig into what does that mean specifically? Uh, what's underneath that? What are the skills and the strategies and the knowledge that really enable somebody to do that? And um, the approach that we've taken is uh, we use uh, something called cognitive interviewing um, methods. And what we've done is we have 
uh, through several programs um, within the DOD that we've worked with. We've had the opportunity to interview hundreds of um, service members from uh, across the services um, in all different kinds of ranks uh, and jobs. Um, in, so Marines, sailors, airmen, um, with special forces, soldiers, of course, special forces, intelligence op, uh, officers uh, and enlisted, of course, and talk to them about their challenges when they were in the thick of, the, thick of it, like you just said, um, and talk to them about how were they dealing with those challenges? And based on their experiences, we, um, we called out, uh, discovered uh, 12 core competencies and skills that really seemed to be driving uh, how they were dealing with and thinking about these situations. And that um, is, is the competencies that are captured in ARC, those 12 competencies. And if we just step back from the 12 competencies at a high level, they're about having strategies to be able to maintain a productive mindset for working in a foreign environment, which some of that has to do with managing your, your attitudes and your emotions. Um, strategies that help you uh, learn about the new culture that you're going into because you can't possibly, somebody can't give you all the information that you need ahead of time. Um, so being able to learn on your own in a self-directed way. Being able to make sense of it when crazy, unexpected, uh, surprising things happen to you, when people want things that come out of nowhere that you hadn't expected. Like, why do they want that? Uh, what do they mean when they're saying this thing I don't understand? So sense making, being able to, to figure out what's going on in a situation. And then the next step is kind of figuring out what to do. What do you say? How do you say it? How do you present yourself? Um, and how do you communicate? Um, effectively in those situations. So those at a high level are the 12 competencies. They're based on best practice. So these are skills that we know uh, people actually use uh, when they're working abroad in a national security context. Um, now the way they're a little bit different, um, if we kind of look at um, how culture is often thought about and how it's taught within uh, DOD programs is you may be familiar with uh, well, we, we spoke already, so I know you're familiar with the Marine Corps' operational uh, culture for the warfighter framework. Um, there is the, uh, the Air Force has the 12 domains of culture and the Army has various planning uh, frameworks such as PEMISI and ASCOPE that have elements of the human domain in them, so, so understanding people. And I, write, I like to think of those as um, they really deal with the what what is it that you should um, think about and know um, when you're going into to working in a foreign environment? So they have to do with knowledge. And the art competencies, uh, they have to do with skills. So the how, how do you uh, use that knowledge to communicate, to make sense of situations and to learn um, and to manage your emotions? So the big difference really is ARC is about the how and other frameworks um, that are usually used are, tend to be more about the what. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, I certainly um, have had my share of experiences where we knew exactly what we were gonna see, but how to deal with it was, uh, was where we were lacking. So I appreciate that aspect of it. And, and that's fantastic. Um, can you give us some examples of, of how cultural competencies apply to special forces and, and maybe more importantly, why it's such a critical element of, of soft mission success? Yeah, so that gets into this interesting dialogue that uh, we just talked about that's going on uh, with special forces identity. Um, and so uh, I think what the what's being talked about right now is that it seems that language, regional expertise and culture, LREC, uh, seems like it's it's not uh, as a central perceived as a as a central part of what uh, special forces is about as maybe it, it used to. Um, and I, I think that uh, the reason, uh, one of the reasons uh, that this has happened, that uh, ELRIC has kind of slipped to the left of center, if you will, of the special forces identity, um, I think has to do with the way uh, ELRIC is, is marketed to, to soldiers. And that, um, that really, that gets to the question, the crux of your question is the value 
Um, and I think often the value of, of cultural competence and, and language skills is often talks about in terms of being able to um, display respect for others, um, avoiding offense and, and accom accommodating cultural differences. And I think, um, I think that to some extent has helped sustain the notion that, that these capabilities are good to know, nice to have, some to put in your back pocket, not necessarily essential. Um, and I think that happens because as soon as uh, a national security professional goes out and sees where the rubber meets the road, they realize that it's, the reality is way more complicated than that, right? It's, um, it's not just about displaying respect, it's also about uh, being able to earn respect um, and showing that you're competent and, um, and not always accommodating because if you do that, you, people can, will step on you uh, or take advantage. And so um, I think the, the value and the benefit that we've seen in our interviews and that we're, we're, that's kind of coming out in Savior Ammo as well that we're trying to demonstrate in the book is that um, the real value to special forces um, and the military in general is that cultural competence really allows you to be smarter about how you accomplish your object objectives in a variety of tasks and mission sets, right? Um, and I think if, if that value is, is called out front and center um, at the beginning of someone's career and, and in LREC training, um, I think um, it will be easier for, for students to appreciate uh, the value and, and kind of make it a more central part of, of who they think they are and, and what they do. So um, yeah, so really it's about um, cultural competence is, gives you the ability to discover, I think, different options uh, when you're working with people for how to engage and how to enact, um, enact your strategies and how to um, deal with problem sets that you come across. And um, I, I could give you an example uh, if you'd like. Sure. Uh, so this is an example we have, uh, we talk about in the book also, and this is actually, um, this is a, a staff sergeant, uh, a Marine who's uh, working in Afghanistan. And this is an example uh, that, that really we used to show uh, that cultural competence is about solving problems. It's not necessarily always about um, making friends or accommodating others. So uh, this staff sergeant is working in Afghanistan with a small team. Uh, there's been a hit on, on their uh, compound that they're living in um, and six members of his team was unfortunately uh, injured and, and killed um, in this attack. And so his team is very highly motivated uh, to find the guys who did this and um, they have access to some local informants that they bring in immediately and talk to. And the objective is to try to figure out where, where are these guys who did it. And they put a map in front of these informants and they look at the map and they shake their heads and they look confused. And it's obvious they have no idea what they're looking at. And so we have, uh, we have shown that situation to, to a number of people. And it's interesting the, the kind of different interpretations people will come up with uh, for what's going on in that situation and what the next steps are. And so I think when you're, when you're in the heat of the moment in a situation like this, I think it, um, the sense that we get from the responses we get from people is that it can be easy to quickly jump to the idea that um, these, guys, these informants are incompetent. They don't know how to read maps or maybe they have some kind of shady motivation for not wanting to give you the information that you're looking for. Uh, the sergeant, the staff sergeant in the situation, he kind of, he stepped back from the moment, from the situation, he thought about what he knew about Afghanistan and what he knew about the kinds of experiences these guys growing up in this environment that they might have had. And so he thought about the kind of the, their situation from from their perspective. And um, perspective taking is one of the competencies uh, in the art model. 
And what that allowed him to realize was that these guys have probably never seen a bird's eye uh, view of an area. So <laughs> they would not have any idea of how to interpret a map and that kind of that led him to the next thought, which was the solution to the problem. Okay, they don't know the bird's eye view, but they do know what this area looks like when they drive around on motorcycles. So he put one of the guys on a motorcycle with a uh, camera strapped to his helmet, rode around uh, the entire uh, village area and showed that video to the, uh, to the two informants. And then right away they could say, oh, go, go down this street, turn left and then right, and then you're there. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> so that's an example of um, how cultural competence is practical and it can help you um, reach your objectives. Sure, yeah. No, it's easy to just assume that there, there's some subterfuge there and they're trying to maybe uh, um, you know, throw you off your, uh, off your scent or whatever, but you know, when you put it in context, you can maybe, maybe get to a solution. That's great. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that, I mean, there's thousands of examples, I'm sure many of them in your, uh, in your book as well. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I've, I've had my fair share as well. Um, in, in terms of um, the actual, um, you know, kind of where you get to solve problems, and that's what we all, as I like the way you put it, cultural understanding is about solving problems. It's not necessarily uh, about making friends. I think that's a great soundbite from, from where we just left off. Um, and so let me let me take that and then switch a little bit into um, what's what you call pattern matching. Um, and first off, if if you'll indulge me um, and the other knuckle dragging Marines like myself, um, maybe just a quick definition on what pattern matching is, uh, and then maybe you can get into kind of how special forces or the military in general leverage this uh, pattern matching across the kind of diverse missions. Yeah. So. Um... Pattern matching is really about the idea that we we all have these templates in our heads, these prototypes uh, that we pick up through our experiences. So we experience patterns of behavior and situations. And from those, we generate a set of expectations about things that um, will happen in the future or expe expectations when we find ourselves in certain situations about what will happen next. So they can kind of help us predict um, what we're going to see uh, in certain situations. And there's a, kind of a theory of expertise out there that um, in order to build expertise, you give people uh, multiple templates for situations. But some, what somebody is lacking when they're not expert is, is experience and having seen hundreds and hundreds of iterations of, um, of, of the domain of, of interest. Um, and so um, I think this idea of pattern matching, um, it's really, it can, it can help, it can work for you and it can work against you uh, when you're working cross-culturally. And so first, let me just talk a little bit about how it can work against you and then I'll get to like, how can we leverage it? Um, and so it, it's, it's really interesting to think about how it can work against us because that's kind of the crux of what makes working across cultures dif, dif, uh, difficult. And that is we've all grown up in a certain culture, cultural environment where certain things happen, where people behave in a certain way and they think in a certain way. So our patterns that we've developed tend to work pretty well uh, for interacting with the people, people from our own culture. And it's when we go overseas, um, we can come up against situations where those templates or those prototypes don't hold up anymore because people don't have the same experience as we do and they don't do things for the same reasons uh, that we might do them. And the way they can trip us up is because these patterns are matched in our heads so quickly. It happens automatically often um, and uh, when that happens, they can trigger responses uh, that may not uh, be well thought out for the situation. Um, so let me give you a quick example of, of what that could look like. Um, so here's another situation, and this was actually uh, a US Special Forces team that were uh, training Jordanian, uh, a Jordanian team. And um, they have been, they're all done with the training and they were setting up for the final exercise. And 
so the US team rigged up a building full of, full of traps and obstacles. And the night before the exercise, uh, the final test was gonna take place, the Jordanian commander uh, comes to the, uh, the US team leader and says, hey, could you take us on a walkthrough of the building uh, before we go in tomorrow? So when we talk to people about that situation, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, that's not what it's about. The purpose of the exercise is to show that you have learned, uh, whether or not you have learned. And the next thought that often comes to mind is, well, that would be cheating. And so that's an example of, that's a perfectly sensible way to think about it in a US training environment. And um, what we hear when we put that in front of um, service members who have a lot of experience working overseas is, um, well, there could be other motivations that this Jordanian commander might have uh, for, ha for this ask. And mainly his superiors are gonna be there tomorrow. And there's a lot of value in this culture on, uh, on face and looking good in front of your superiors. And in this environment, the final exercise might have a different significance than it does than what we're used to. So if you in those kinds of situations where we, we have immediate thoughts that come to mind, we immediately know what's going on. Those are the kinds of situations where it's, um, we found that it's really helpful to kind of step back and, and, and think a little bit and, and think, could there be something else going on with this guy? Why is he, why is he asking me this at this moment? And so that's, uh, that's where sense-making comes in and ha having strategies for kind of figuring out what could be alternative explanations and what else could be going on. So that you have some, again, so you have some options for how to handle the situation. And importantly, it's not about whether or not you give them the walkthrough or not, it's, it's really about, do you understand uh, what's going on in the situation? And are you making an uh, informed decision uh, based on that understanding? Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I, it's, you know, it's interesting how um, there's a different, that your, your book covers so much, and, and certainly the, this, the ARC model concept covers a lot of the, uh, when you're dealing with adversaries versus partners, um, you know, why you might want to have an, a cultural understanding on your adversary is, is relatively obvious. Um, but, but your partners, it's actually, especially when you're training, uh, when you're working in a multinational environment, trying to train someone to operate the same way you do, the importance on what you just covered, I mean, it, there's so many things that can go wrong by just not understanding simple um, elements of how uh, a, a captain in, in another country's army may want to not Want, may want to save face with in front of their colonel or something like that, and that's these are these are elements that um, can obviously lead to uh, um, either having a great exercise, great training environment, or or a, um, a relatively ineffective uh, um, you know discourse between two nations trying to figure something out at, at a lower level. So anyway, okay. so that's great. That's great. Um, so as since we just kind of went into that kind of training realm, let me pull the thread a little bit more there and. Um, let me ask your opinion um, on how we better can integrate the cultural and linguistic competence into the into our training modules. Uh, how do we actually um, do that? But then more, maybe more importantly, how do we actually measure success? Right. You just asked some very big <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, yeah, because these are hard problems that I this uh, there's a big community um, he, around Elric that have been looking at these issues for a long time, and so I'll I'll give you my opinion on it. And I think I want to uh, I think there's two big pieces uh, to that question that I can address, and that is kind of from a programmatic perspective, um, what are the ideal kind of setup for a program to teach uh, these skills, and then also getting into the content. Uh, of what, is, what should that training contain. Um, but I think before I kind of go there, I think there, it's also, it's always important to kind of think about uh, the status quo, what's, what's going on right now. And, and I think what I've been hearing in the narrative um, kind of in Elric, in the Elric community over the last several years is kind of, um, an objection, if you will, to, to thinking about um, 
uh, culture kind of from a skills perspective and, or in a, and a, a reluctance, if you will, to go there. And the, there's kind of three easy button styles of thinking um, that I kind of have picked up on out there. And one of them is uh, getting back to the knowledge. Culture is knowledge. Uh, we can arm people with information, um, show them uh, a PowerPoint or uh, tell them where they can go find the last 10 years of sit reps uh, to read through for the region that they're going into and then they'll be ready. Um, so culture is, is more than information. So I think some, there needs to be some kind of education uh, to kind of understand culture from a skills-based perspective um, in order to get there. There's also kind of a, a line of thinking that if you have a program that has a language component to it, well, then you get culture for free. And that is, you know, you're already learning a language and you can't separate language and culture. Um, so we're kind of, if we have a language program, then we're covered. And I think that, you know, you, you don't get culture for free, especially not the uh, skills-based or competency-based uh, aspect of culture uh, just through a language program, unless it is de deliberately designed uh, to help people build those skills as well, along with language. Um, and then there's the idea that, well, people will pick it up for, you know, they'll pick it up once you send them overseas. Um, and so they will learn it through experience. And that also the literature shows that there's not a perfect correlation between experience um, and, and the development of cultural competence. So just, just because you've been there doesn't mean you, you know how to do it. So I think from a programmatic perspective, um, I think uh, culture, cultural competence, the way we've just talked about it, some of the examples that we went through, um, it's, it's part of what people already do. So uh, cultural considerations, cultural communication um, is a natural uh, part of, of a lot of the activities that uh, service members already learn about and do. It's about, it's, uh, it's a part of critical part of the planning process, uh, mission analysis, uh, kind of any basic preparation there, there is or should be cultural considerations as part of that. And so I think um, the training in general should match the way culture is being used in practice. Um, and so what that means is I, if I was queen for a day, I would, and if it was organizational, organizationally possible, I think we should get rid of the stove piping idea where culture is over here. Culture is the last hour of the last day uh, of this other course, or it's in this week. So, um, it, instead, it should be woven through uh, other activities that, that people are already learning about and doing. Um, and so if we look just at an, at an LREC program, I think um, it should certainly start with the why. Why are we learning about this? How can cultural competence give me different options for tackling situations that I'm gonna be finding myself in? Starting with that, weaving uh, cultural competence through the language program and having activities that allow people to practice both language um, in, in the context of realistic situations um, where they also have the opportunity to practice perspective taking and sense making um, and figuring out how they're gonna be learning new things about this uh, region that they're learning a language in. Um, so, that's kind of programmatically, I think uh, the content uh, kind of goes along with that. Um, I think it needs to be, when we're talking about cultural competence, we're talking about skills. Skills require practice. You can't just read about them. Um, it's not something that you can just understand declaratively, just like riding a bicycle. You can't just read about it and then know how to do it. Um, so cultural competence should be taught in an environment where there's opportunity to practice the skills, uh, see lots and lots of situations and examples, um, have opportunities to think through how are you really gonna communicate in this situation? Uh, so an example we hear a lot when uh, folks are working with foreign partners 
is they don't show up on time necessarily in some cultures. Well, what are you gonna say when they're not on time? Thinking about your communication ahead of time is a critical part of uh, communication um, cultural competence. And uh, that's something that, that can be practiced, um, particularly in the context of, of learning a language. So having scenarios, uh, tasks and, and problem sets uh, that people have to practice uh, thinking through, um, I think that's going to bring the teaching of cultural competence much closer to what the actual practice of it looks like on the ground. Um, so yeah, uh, we've had some reactions when we when we talk about these competencies and, and some folks say, well, this is really simple stuff. It's common sense things that you're talking about here. And, and the experience that we've had is uh, operators who, who have a lot of experience who've been there say it's, it's not simple. Um, once you're, you're in the thick of it and you're tired and you're stressed and you might be homesick, uh, thinking about what somebody else's perspective is, is, is not straightforward. Um, and with, that's why uh, these are important skills that require a lot of practice. Sure. Yeah. No, it, it's, you know, I'll just comment on that last point you made is that, you know, it may, it may sound simple to some people. However, I can tell you from personal experience, you know, I'm looking across the room. I have a bookshelf across from my desk here that um, has all of my DLI basic and intermediate Arabic course uh, books and all of the language things are this thick, you know, some, some of the dictionaries are even thicker. And then I've got this teeny little cultural, Arab cultural, uh, you know, book that was part of our, we had once a week on Thursdays or whatever it was. Um, and none of that, I mean, you know, and there's some, some basics in there about what not to do in situations and how to respect um, the culture, but, um, but nothing prepared me or anyone else uh, from reading your book. There's some great examples in there. Uh, nothing prepares you that you're going to have to drink 10 gallons of, of the strongest coffee you've ever had in your life or, or, you know, drink, um, a bunch of different sweet teas or or smoke a pack of cigarettes just to get connected to these guys. I mean, these these are weird little things that you, you don't until you practice the skills of actually just getting used to a culture and and um, being flexible and, and adaptive to what's going on around you. Um, you. You don't really know it. And, you, you know, you can call it simple. But for an 18 year old uh, enlisted Marine, um, these are important things to have. They're, they're, these uh, Marine soldiers, sailors are all acting as our, as our diplomats out there. And, and these are important critical elements, especially for, for a soft mission where you really need to um, have built in trust with the, peop the, the nation that you're going to and working with. So it's great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we've heard the feedback so far is from, uh, from programs that are teaching uh, younger service members, the reactions we're hearing is, uh, uh, Students thought this was the least boring book on culture that they've ever had to read. And then also just the situations, um, which they have never been in. They've never, they don't know what it's really like. We've heard comments like, well, this gives me some templates for how to think differently about some of these situations. Mm -hmm. And we love hearing that because that, that's exactly the idea, um, yeah. is to kind of broaden your aperture a little bit before you go in. Uh, to kind of calibrate your expectations. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's the, certainly part of the theme here, um, not just in the discussion with what, what soft needs in the world of, of culture, but, um, but we've, I think your, your point about weaving it into all the aspects of training, as opposed to it being the last thing you, you look at right before you go over is, you know, oh, by the way, this is the type of architecture you're going to see there, you know, like as if you're in some sort of photos, like tourism book, like you actually need to have some practical application on these things. And I think that's key. Um, and empathy too, listening and having, having empathy, I think are key, right? Um, so, okay, so as we, as we you know, start to wrap up here, I know we're, we're running a bit on time. Um, I, wanna, I wanted to just touch on one more topic with you, which um, you know, in our, some of our previous discussions on these, um, these webinars, we've, we've covered uh, information operations, IO. Um, and, you know, as the military kind of wades further into the what they call the great power competition or two plus three in these kind of worlds, um, in, in from your view, looking at it just from the cultural competence kind of model that we've discussed, um, how can um, improving that cultural competence 
enhance IO, information operations, um, and, that, and that mission's you know, non-kinetic execution? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, um, I think actually cultural competence has implications for uh, a couple of the, like you said, information operations, but an, a, another big uh, national security strategy thrust right now, which is security cooperation. So I think first of all, um, uh, for information operations, um, what we're hearing is, well, first of all, there's, there's more, not less information out in the world every day um, to be processed, to be uh, transformed into meaningful data that somebody is going to be making decisions on at, at some juncture. And um, so I think human beings uh, tend to get overwhelmed uh, with large amounts of information. And that's in the cultural competence realm. What we're hearing is um, younger service members who are coming into their careers are, are just overwhelmed with the amount of information that's being passed to them about these uh, regions um, and the people that they're going to be uh, working in. So I think it's going to be become ever more critical that we, we have a deliberate deliberate approach to equip uh, people for how to deal with that aspect. And uh, as that relates to co cultural competence, the way we think of it, um, it's really about making sure that people are uh, self-directed learners, that they recognize that the, it, the onus is on them uh, to kind of to get the information that they need um, to, to make good decisions in the environments that they're going to be working with. And then having some strategies for how to be an information processor, how to make sense out of it, how to uh, make meaning out of it, and how do you use uh, other knowledge that you have to, um, to kind of understand it better. Um, so, so teaching people sense-making strategies is going to be um, ever more critical. And I, I think the second part of this um, also, um, we often hear um, about uh, security cooperation cooperation is a big component of um, kind of, as I'm hearing, we're dealing with uh, great power competition. And that is uh, going out and, and building relationships with our allies and partners, which cultural competence is a central um, aspect of, of that. And if we're to become uh, the partner of choice, if you will, um, in the future, I think it's critical that that our people are, are able to be able to hit the ground running uh, on building relationships and maintaining those relationships. Um, and beyond that, being able to think with our partners, not for them. So really being able to participate in a meaningful uh, collaboration uh, with our partners requires that there's some kind of uh, mutual understanding uh, in place of, of where each other is coming from. And I think cultural competence um, is critical for that. Oh, that's great, yeah. Now certainly uh, these are all elements with the changing world of, of information and the ease in which you can access, uh, access information, but also um, the ease in which you can disseminate information. Uh, the competency in which we understand each other uh, certainly plays a bigger role than ever, for sure. Um, so, I mean, that was fantastic, Dr. Rasmussen. I, I really, you know, hopefully it was, it was enjoyable for you, but, um, you know, your brilliant insights, um, that, you know, cu cultural competence allows you to be smarter, more efficient um, in how you accomplish your missions, I think kind of we started off with. And, and moving into, I, I think my favorite soundbite from earlier was the uh, cultural competence about solving problems and not making friends, right? Um, you know, that's, I, I think that, um, that really speaks at least to the Marine in me, um, you know, you, you meet a lot of people and, you, and it's hard to, um, as other human beings, to, to put that barrier up to make sure that you're focusing on your mission, but you have to also at the same time be empathetic to their needs and their desires. And I think that's where you get, um, you get a truly effective understanding of their culture. Um, uh, that the fact that it should be woven through all parts of training um, and, and, and answering the why and the how, you know, those kind of things, and then practice, practice, practice. These are all elements that, that I think will improve our, our flexibility and our expectations of what we encounter when we get to uh, this mission in an in a, um, Oconus environment, but also the adaptiveness in which we, um, we deliver the, the, the training or the, the combined operations with other nations. Um, 
you know, I think, I think all of these um, things are going to help us build stronger partnerships, stronger relationships with the global community, if you will. So, um, so thank you for, for kind of giving us um, that whole, I mean, I probably did a poor job of summarizing the brilliance in which you, you laid it out, but uh, anything I missed? <laughs> no, those are absolutely the highlights. I think those yeah. were definitely the main points that, that I wanted to talk about today. And yeah. I just, I, if you, I would just want to end with, uh, uh, we've had some really good uh, outreach from people who read our book. And uh, one of them was actually uh, a former Green Beret who reached out to me and was just really happy about uh, kind of the initiative uh, that, that we've been working on. And he, uh, he told me this uh, quote that I just, I, he just summarizes um, the need for this so well. And he, he, he said to me, he was really concerned about the fact that uh, the time uh, that he felt that he was spending in training, uh, learning how to deal with people um, was far, uh, far less than uh, what was required and, and far was very disproportionate uh, to the amount of time that he actually spends dealing with people uh, when he was uh, assigned overseas relative to the amount of time that he spent shooting at people. Mm, wow. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's no higher praise than, than hearing uh, someone on the ground truth uh, talking about the, the need for what you're doing and, and how effective it is. So, so that's, that's awesome. That's great. That's great. Um, and your book, Save, uh, Save Your Ammo, Working Across Cultures from uh, for national security on the bookshelves now, as they say, I definitely highly recommend everyone pick up a copy. Um, Absolutely. The, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think it's great. I think it's great. I, I think it, um, it, it sets a baseline really for, for all of us to hopefully we, we move towards. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, understanding each other is probably, if, if nothing else can be the theme of 2020, maybe that can, we can shift to that as, <laughs> at some point to salvage something of this year. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, Dr. Rasmussen, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you and please keep up the great work uh, that you do. Uh, it's fantastic and um, I really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you all for watching. We hope these conversations continue to inform and inspire you. And we all look forward uh, uh, to, or we all look for ways to better our global understanding and make positive impacts. So until next time, stay healthy and stay safe.